Uh, welcome, everybody. Aloha. Happy New Year. Thanks for being here for our first installment of the Slice of High Cast seminar series for this year, 2024. Wow. Um, this Slice of High Cast seminar, uh, a monthly seminar is hosted by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center, or PICASC. I'm Brad Romine. I'm the Deputy Director uh, for the University Consortium of PICASC, and I welcome you all. Uh, this monthly slice of podcast seminar series provides a platform for sharing state-of-the-art climate adaptation research and science to management applications in Hawaii, the U.S. Affili affiliated Pacific Islands, and beyond. These seminars are typically held on the first Tuesday of the month um, here in HIG 210 or online. Uh, we moved it uh, one week later uh, this month to uh, coincide with the uh, start of the semester here at UH Manoa. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, those of you joining us uh, in person here, if you haven't already, help yourself to some lunch. Um, at the conclusion of our talk, we'll have a pie, as we often do, from Rachel, um, has kindly baked a pie to go along with our slice of pie cast theme. So thank you again, Rachel. Um, and I understand it's a pie chart this time. Is that right? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right, so this presentation, as you probably saw coming online, is being recorded. Um, we ask those online to stay on mute. Um, we will leave time at the end for uh, questions with, with uh, Dr. Longman, um, but do feel free to also leave questions in the chat along the way. And again, we'll come to those uh, at the end of the talk. So with that, um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ryan Longman, uh, who'll be sharing with us today on the Hawaii Climate Data Portal from soup to nuts. Ryan is a climate scientist uh, working as an Oceana Fellow in the East West Center's research program and the Senator's Pacific Islands Development Program. He's also an affiliated climate scientist with the Water Resources Research Center. Ryan's teaching and scientific research in the Pacific Islands focuses on climate science, climate monitoring, the quality control and assurance of environmental data, climate change adaptation, as well as climate finance. Ryan completed his PhD in geography here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, researching the effects of trade wind inversion variability on high elevation climates in Hawaii. He co-leads the development of the Pacific Drought Knowledge Exchange and the Hawaii Climate Data Portal, uh, again, the latter of which we'll hear more about today. Ryan was also my son's uh, basketball coach, little known fact. Um, did an excellent job at that. It was a lot of fun for the kids, but Ryan, I want to ask you which is uh, more challenging, climate science or leading a uh, group of over-exuberant <laughs> eight-year-old basketball players? Climate science. Yeah. Okay. That's the other thing. It's fun. You know? All right. Well, yeah. thanks for being here with us today, Ryan. I'll pass it over yeah. to you and uh, and take it away. All right. Mahalo. Thanks, Brad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, aloha and happy new year. Really, um, I'm flattered the fact that you folks have taken time out of your busy schedule to be here today. Um, if your lives are anything like mine, um, things went from zero to 100 miles an hour pretty fast when the new year started. So really acknowledging everybody online, everybody in this room that, that took their time out to come hear this talk, really appreciate it. Also, thanks to PyCast for inviting me and letting me kick off their um, the really awesome series they have uh, for 2024. I have a long history with the Climate Adaptation Science Centers that dates back to my master's degree and getting some funding from there, my PhD. So uh, anything I can do to support this organization is really, it's, it's my pleasure. So I'm going to share my screen here and we're going to get going. All right, so Hawaii Climate Data Portal from soup to nuts. Okay, and let me just, uh, Rachel, I am not getting this. Um, is it not working? Quick pivot. Okay, so um, I can advance this way too. Actually, it's not working that way either. Okay, all right. So soup to nuts. Is anybody wondering what that means? Right, okay. So it's this, I was trying to cover the title for this talk and I was trying to think of something catchy and I had these really long titles and I told my wife, she was like, that's a terrible title. And I'm just like, I was really stuck. So I was at the end of a call I had and uh, Christian Giardino was on the call and I just, like told him, and I'm like, I haven't stumbled with this uh, title. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And I told him, he's like, sounds like soup to nuts. So quickly I Googled soup to nuts to find out that it means basically from beginning to end. 
Okay, it was the first thing that came up. Then I took a little deeper dive and found out that it's kind of a culinary term. That means from uh, you know your appetizer to your dessert. So um, I uh, kind of framing things today in, in that context of the appetizer to dessert um, of way I'm gonna lay this out. So today's menu, um, starting out with the appetizer, we'll talk about how we got here with the HEDP. Um, the main course, uh, you know, what we're up to now with some of the product development, some of the function features. And then for dessert, we'll talk about where the project is headed. Now, throughout though, I'm going to be refilling your glasses with the people that are actually doing the work because I have the luxury of always being the front face of the HEDP, uh, the one that's out there, you know, doing the work in terms of promoting the work, but there's really a lot of people behind the scenes. So this presentation is dedicated to a lot of people. So if you want to log off now, you've at least learned what soup to nuts is, but there's more. So if you want to stay around, let's, let's keep going. So how did we get here? All right, this is the first time I really laid this out. And I was thinking about the story of the HTDP. And I had to go back uh, 34 years to the beginning. Now you could probably pin this anywhere, but I'm pinning this 34 years ago. In 1988, while I was wrapping up sixth grade at Ocean Township Intermediate School in New Jersey, Tom Giambaluca was on the slopes of Haleakala installing climate stations, the first of um, uh, eventually 11 in the Holynet Climate Network. So uh, between 1998 and 2000, the Hollynet Climate Network was established. And then following that, in the next decade, there was other local networks established. The HIPNet from the Forest Service and uh, UH uh, Hawaii and Hilo, uh, the HABONet, which is in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, Little Hollynet, which is on the uh, eastern side of Haleakala, and then CraterNet, which is in the crater. So this is Paul Krasonecki and Shelly Crosby and other folks that really established these networks. So we had this really amazing time of monitoring climate, but we were actually the ones managing a lot of the data. Myself, Mike Nullet, Tom Jamaluka, like this whole lab area was dealing with the data. And it was kind of tricky. So this period was really processing data, manual quality control and data storage, right? Trying to figure out how to manage this data that's coming in now. <clears throat> Moving on, um, in 2013, there was the publication of the Hawaii Rainfall Atlas. And the reason this is important is because Abby Fraser did a big lift on figuring out what data was available at the monthly time step, looking at ranches, looking at different um, areas, trying to get archives, also figuring out how to do some gap filling. Um, so that was a big effort on terms of figuring out what station exi data existed. Then we published the evapotranspiration or climate of Hawaii website, which is more variables than rainfall. And we had to do another lift to figure out what other variables were out there, right? So a lot of work went into figuring out is it beyond rainfall, what other variables existed and where to get them. <clears throat> then in um, 2016, Abby Fraser published her uh, set of month year rainfall maps. And you see they go from 1920 to 2012. So <clears throat> this was an important data product. Um, but um, again, it, you know, it ended in 2012 and was published in 2016. In 2018, I was part of a, a, a effort to find all of the daily rainfall, right? So Abby did monthly, I did daily, and all these other variables, the temperature um, and at least rainfall. And then in 2019, I published a paper, um, again, it went to 2014, it was published in 2019. So um, this period of time was looking at data inventory, really figuring out what's available at what time step, uh, figuring out gap filling at the daily time step and, and monthly, developing some products like the maps that we had, but really also the need for product automation. Because I can tell you, and Abby will back me up on this, uh, in 2016, when her maps came out, immediately she's getting emails. This is awesome. Where, where are the maps? You know, in 2012, where are the maps for 2013? And that went on for years and years and years. When are you gonna update this? When are you gonna update this? And when I published in 2014, the same thing. When are you gonna update this? So the need was coming from people that want to do analyses. Another problem was that for Abby's uh, maps, for example, that ended in 2012, which was this really mega drought that we had in Hawaii. So you're looking at all every time series you have ends in this really dry point, you know? So, but you know, almost 10 years down the road in 2022, you're still doing analysis on those maps. It's really not telling you what happened over the last decade. So automation became this really uh, key priority. So the EPSCOR Ikivai project, um, which is the NSF project um, that's uh, you know initiated through the University of Hawaii, uh, spun up in 2019, and we they came to us, the PI, in the second year of it, and said, "Hey, do you want to be part of this project? What do you guys want to do?" And it was like right off the bat, we knew right away we wanted to do. We wanted to make maps and automate the process 
automate data collection. We wanted to build a data portal. It was crystal clear. And oh, excuse me, we laid out what we wanted to do and they agreed to it. So we started at that point. It took us a few years of development, but um, and we eventually launched the ACDP in uh, March 3rd to 2022. We literally got it working on um, February 28th that year. And uh, <laughs> we're really pleased uh, when it when it worked. So um, it was a lot of effort that went into that, but we had our official launch. And then since that time, Matt Lucas has published his rainfall maps. Uh, we've also uh, got continued funding through the next round of EBSCOR funding through the Change Hawaii program. That's kind of keep the development, the cyber infrastructure going, product development. And then Carrie Kodama um, just published her rainfall or her temperature maps just last month. And that goes up to 2018. So um, this period of time was really about building cyber infrastructure. And that's why we could never do it on our own. We could never build a climate portal because climate scientists don't know how to build climate portals. It's just a data science question. So we could never really come to that 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 point in time until we got involved with the data scientists through the EBSCOR projects. But um, <clears throat> yeah, building cyber infrastructure, product automation, and then publishing methodologies. And now also in 2023, we've had the Hawaii Mesonet. And I'm gonna tell you more about that in a few slides, but having this come online, the stations that are coming available now, building that infrastructure to bring in this really high quality data that's happening now in the last year. And as we move into 2024, we're really starting to see some of the fruits of these labors, um, looking at building some decision support and some products some derived products that have come from these efforts. So again, we're kind of moving into more data, better data and building products off of what we've already done. But if we didn't have the 1988 Slopes of Haleakala, Polynet Climate Network, we never would have been at this point now, right? So it's really important to go back 34 years to really see the big picture. And this is a new slide that I made. It took me way too long to make this slide, <clears throat> but I made it now and it'll, it'll live on for a while. Um, so um, I, I appreciate telling this story because it's the first time I really ever told it this way. Now, what is the HDP? How does it really work? Okay, so, um, Weather stations, we are, we're collecting stations from the Hawaii Mesonet, but also from other networks, right, that, that monitor or maintain their own stations out in the field in Hawaii. These data are fed into these, uh, these data repositories, these national repositories, MADIS, HADS, National Weather Service. They're all very unique in their own way how to access it. It's not very easy to just go there and get the data. You need the right code to actually pull the data down. The HADS data is only there for three days, and then it's gone. I mean, gone, doesn't exist. So you got to grab it pretty much within a three-day window or you're never going to get it, right? Don't ask me why, but um, we the data goes into these repositories. And then from there, <clears throat> we write the code to pull the data into a storage on the <clears throat> in the Hawaii, uh, Hawaii Data Science Center in, on the cluster. <clears throat> we pull in the data in the storage, then we process it with some quality assurance, quality control methods. And then now that process data then feeds back into a database that's also maintained by University of Hawaii. We also take the process data and we create gridded products and those gridded products feed back into the database. And then um, this is basically essentially what the HTTP is on the data side. It's basically this, 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 this mechanism to grab data, process it and produce products. Now you can access it through the interface and users can download and visualize all of the data that's been processed and is now stored on the database. We also realize that not all data is available in near real time. There's critical stations that come available. We have stations that uh, on Haleakala that it takes a helicopter to get to and there's no signal and it happens every two years, critical stations. So you wanna find a way to be able to bring that data in and we can do that um, also with latent data. We can run it through the same process and then we can update the gridded products and the daily time, the daily products as well, the gridded endpoint. This is the uh, <clears throat> the core team that's kind of met regularly. We've had 50 meetings since I started counting and more before that. But there's a climate science team, a data science team, and really a communication uh, person that's that's been there since almost the beginning. And um, um, these folks are really the, the core that's kind of making HTTP go. We also have key contributors, other folks that have come and gone on these block meetings that we have and are there available for outreach and things like that. So it's kind of a bigger team and there's even more people than this that have kind of, you know, entered in on the periphery. But this is kind of what I look at is really the foundation of, of how this thing, how this operates. 
Now, <clears throat> the gridded products, all right, this will be relevant to some, and um, we'll move on to, to other things as well, but uh, the gridded products are really important for a number of applications. Um, a lot of modeling, decision support tools, uh, exploration, all happens on that gridded, you know, that, that gridded level, where anywhere in the state you can look at something, understand an environmental phenomenon. Um, we started the, the portal with this initial data set from Abby Fraser, the 2012, and Matt Lucas, his rainfall update has gone up to near real time. They we're producing those, you know, as of last month. Uh, so it's 104 years of rainfall data. We have uh, daily and monthly temperature, a carry Kodama, uh, minimum, maximum, and mean temperature. We have uh, future projections of rainfall and temperature. This is the CMIP5 stuff from Elliot Parsons um, uh, for statistical downscaling and um, the dynamical downscaling. And then Abby Fraser has done some bias correction that uh, makes the products kind of comparable. So you can go on and get all of this stuff from the portal. It's been there for a little while. Um, it's not that it's not new stuff I'm presenting you today. That was there at the beginning. The new stuff, however, that's coming online, it's, it's there now, um, at least in a, a static format. We have the normalized uh, difference, uh, difference vegetation index or NDVI. This is a modus product that exists already, but the problem is it's cloud contaminated. So a lot of efforts gone into using machine learning to fill those gaps of clouds and it's essentially become a new product. This is a, tells you whether it's green or brown in a particular area and this will move into near real-time production. So every 16 days, we'll have a new map that's available for, for use. Uh, we also have uh, relative humidity, something that Kerry Kodama has been working on starting in 2002 to December 2021 right now, that will also be in near real-time production. Relative humidity is a variable that's really hard to map in Hawaii because in most places, as you go up in elevation, relative humidity increases because the ability for the air to hold moisture decreases. But in Hawaii, we have this unique thing called the trade wind inversion that has really dry air. So as you're going up the mountain, it gets higher and higher and higher and all of a sudden you hit the inversion and relative humidity goes lower. So any model that you would apply anywhere else in the world doesn't typically work in Hawaii. So Carrie has to be really creative about that and I'm sure she'll probably publish those methods um, at some point this year. <clears throat> and um, yeah, we also have uh, daily rainfall. I know a lot of folks are excited about this. Uh, Matt Lucas is leading the charge on this. This is uh, there's a static data set available now in the data portal to 2019, but uh, Matt is working on the real time production of that, and we expect that really any day now um, to have that available, and that'll allow us to look at things like consecutive dry days, really really look under the cover in drought in terms of you know and, and rainfall events also. And then coming soon, things that are kind of in development that but don't really aren't on the portal right now. We have hourly and uh, daily wind speed. Uh, we're using this product called Wind Ninja. It's uh, mounted now on the Hawaii supercomputer, and we're, we're, we're going to be spitting these wind maps out in near real time, again, on the hourly. So this is our first product that we've kind of crossed into that sub-daily territory. We also have four-component uh, net radiation. So um, we have, uh, you know, Peter Sadowski and his grad student, Yusuke, um, are developing shortwave radiation coming down and up and longwave radiation coming up and down. That's good for a number of applications and energy balance. This will be near real time production as well. And uh, Matt Lucas is uh, developing a, uh, a land cover, a fractional land cover map. And this is something that will update annually because land cover doesn't change that much. So that's kind of what we're, we're, we're working on right now, right? The gridded products that will be available probably all of them in 2024 and in near real time production. But gridded products are one thing. What do we actually do with that data? And this is probably the, the part of the presentation that I'm, I'm most excited about is telling you a little bit about the function features of the HCDP. Things that all of you could do, um, all of you can interact with at some point here in the future. So the first thing is um, you can make a map. You can really make a map, any map you want, any day of the week of any variable that we have available and uh, at any point in time that we have available. You can select the variable, you select the time step, whether you want monthly or daily. You can then select the actual month you want. You then select between five different base layers. And I think this is cool because if you want to make a map, you can make a map, you can take all the climate data off and just make a map of the streets around your house without any proprietary statistical or geospatial software or anything. You can just go make a map, it's an awesome mapping tool. You can toggle the stations on and off, the data on and off if you want. You can change the opacity of the map. You can select between seven different color ramps or you could upload your own custom color ramp. 
And um, you can change the extent in the frame. You can zoom into an island, you could go out, you could have a couple islands, a county, you can move around, really functionality with this. And then you can just hit this little button up here and download the JPEG, put it right into your presentation, put it right into your Christmas card, whatever you want to do with it. <clears throat> it's that it's that easy to do. And my kids, you know, when I first, we launched this thing in March, 2022, they're six, my youngest son was six years old and I had him making maps. So it's not complicated at all. So <clears throat> I put a gold star up here because I want to hold this up. This is an amazing feat because to do this prior to the HTTP, you'd have to first have the data available, which again, if you want to do, let's say monthly rainfall maps, they go to 2012. So anytime, if you're not 2012, you're dealing with something in the past. If you wanted yesterday's rainfall map, it would be a major, or yet last month's rainfall map, it would be a major data grab, data processing, figuring out a methodology, making the map. And then once you made it, you'd have to have GIS or some type of geospatial software to bring the map in, do all these tools, a major effort, months, months, and months of work. And now anybody can go and make last month's rainfall map and customize it the way they want with relative ease. So that's why the gold star is there because I have to hold that up is how amazing this is and how much time it's going to save and how it didn't exist, the ability to do this prior to the HTTP. Um, we also have ways to explore the data. So this is looking um, at the actual station data, not the map, the gridded part. So it's looking at point data. Um, in April of 2018, when we had the, the most significant 24-hour rainfall in the state of Hawaii, uh, you can click on the uh, time series um, and, you know, you can identify extremes. So for gridded products, you don't always want to look at extremes because the interpolation kind of smooths things. But looking at point data can tell you um, the extremes. So I could zoom into that time series, time series 34 years, but I could zoom in for that one particular day or week if I want to. And and I could download this graph also with just the click of a button and have that time series. Again, presentation, Christmas card, whatever you want to do with it, it's that easy to get. Um, the other uh, things you can do is you can just click on a station and you can get different uh, metadata for that station. You can get the, lo the lo local stations that are close by, find out the island they're on, different elements there. Uh, again, really interactive, just hover over it. And this is something that <clears throat> I'm probably most excited to tell you about. This is our virtual station option. And when we first came into the HTTP and had these conversations, we said, this would be cool. But I didn't think it was possible. Again, because I'm a climate scientist and I have no idea how I would somebody would do something like this. But what we have a tool now is where you can go and you can just pick any point on the map. It does not matter if there's a station there or anything. You pick on the point and you will automatically get a time series generated for that point going back for 34 years, right? Anywhere. And then the graphs will populate. You can look at the different time series the, at the daily time step or the monthly time step. And then you can download um, that data, zoom into whatever interested area you are and just download maps if you want. Um, as a, and you download the data and the map and the, and the graph, all three of them. Now, there's a gold star here also because say you're doing a study somewhere and you wanna know the rainfall, right? Previously, prior to this option, you would have to either A, go find the closest station, which may not be close at all, and get the data, if that was easy. Let's say it was an easy station. You get the data, maybe it's representative. It's not. Maybe there's gaps in it. Maybe there's you know problems with the data. You know That's what you'd have to do. Go find some data that's close by. Or you could, if there were maps available, you'd have to have some code, write some code to do this. It would be a complicated task. Now, anybody, can go to the portal, click on any spot they want, any area of interest, their backyard, their research site, an area they want to go visit, whatever the case might be, and get a time series of rainfall for that. You know, So again, touch of a button, uh, really easy to do. This is Jared McLean. He's the lead software engineer at, on the Hawaii Climate Data Portal. And uh, really everything that I've shown you, this, this was the best slide to put his picture in. But everything that I've showed you has been developed um, by his by his hands. So really, uh, hats off to Jarrett and the efforts he made in this this particular tool. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> moving in now, also on the HTTP, what we're bringing in is the Hawaii Mesonet. So it's a separate project funded by uh, NSF. Tom Jambaluk is leading this project, and um, I'm hoping that everybody in the room has heard of the Mesonet and everybody online. Um, because we know it's been it's been around for now for about a year and a half, almost two years, and you know there's been a lot of outreach about this. But I won't be surprised if if folks all don't know about it. But the Mesonet is an effort to 
install 100 full climate stations across the Hawaiian Islands. And this is the, the core installation team here. There's other PIs and folks that are involved in, um, in this process as well. But um, the effort here is to, you know, put high quality data to install these stations to get high quality data across the islands and feed that into the HTDP. So the way it works in the HTDP right now is that you can go here right in the middle, click on this green button here. You can access the, the little information about the Hawaii Mesonet. Then you can click data access. Uh, brings up a stage here of all, there's a couple of ways to do this, but you can uh, look at all the different stations that are available. And then you can click on an individual station if you want, and then you can get the actual data. And this is actual five minute data. So this is what you'll get be getting data that happened five minutes ago, right? So forget daily, forget, you know, hourly, we're talking just, you know, five minute data at, at your fingertips. So this will tell you about, you know, things that are happening really in real time, wind speed, temperature, there's I think 21, there's 21 variables. So really uh, data at your fingertips again for the closest station located to you. You can also click on the uh, station map here if you wanna see where the stations have been deployed every time a new station goes up. There's gonna be a hundred, I think there's 42 right now. So there's gonna be 16 more points on this map you know, by the end of next year um, or 2025. And um, I, uh, they'll just be populated near real time. So you click on the map, you can, you can Lots of ways to explore the data. Again, you can look at daily, you can, the, the, you can look at sub daily, look at these summaries and um, really interact with the data. <clears throat> All right, we're also working with, um, you know, Jason Lee at the Lava Lab and Roderick Tabala, and he is uh, working on um, developing these Mesonet dashboards. So these are really sophisticated dashboards that allow you to take the Mesonet data and customize them and make them any way you want. So if you have a study site and you want to look at two stations and compare the data, you want to, you're using the Sage platform. So if you want to bring in a map of rainfall and I mean, Sage is a whole nother presentation in itself, but this is really an awesome platform. He's building this fluid connection between HEDP, Mesonet and the Sage environment to be able to create custom dashboards. And that's really good for individual stakeholders that have, you know, that are monitoring several stations or monitoring the environment in some way or another. Also looking at things like wind farming planning and, 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 and you know, building other activities. So we have just a bunch of ideas right now of what you can do uh, with these dashboards. Uh, they're in the early stages of development, but um, RJ is a really sharp guy and he's making uh, extremely fast project uh, progress with this. And <clears throat> I would be remiss not to mention the qualitative uh, information that's in the HCDP. Amy Schreiber, who's in the room here, um, we hired her as an undergraduate. She was the only person who applied to the job. And uh, so made my decision very easy, but also was very thankful because she has done really an incredible work here. Everything you see on the HEDP minus the data portal itself has been done by Amy, every single thing. So I um, don't even know how I would have done without her. I don't even know the password to the WordPress site. Full disclosure. You know, I have some ideas. Amy helps me execute them. It's really, it's really great, a great teamwork there. So we have a reference library. There's, um, you know, about 400 journal articles, reports. We have the National Weather Service summaries, which are only available for the last year. So um, the, you can, you know, if you want to go back beyond a year and look at something like a, a hurricane or um, um, a disturbance event or a rainfall event, you have to email Kevin Kodama and ask him for that, but really now they're available now on the portal and we update those every month. <clears throat> we also have a, a cultural resources page. This is something that we've <clears throat> spent a little bit of time on the last year. We still have a ways to go on it. Um, I'm putting up the moon calendar here because the moon calendar is the most visited site, the visited page on the HTTP. For some reason, everybody is drawn to the moon calendar page. So we've put some effort into, you know, ramping it up, improving our visuals on that. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the cultural resources page is um, something that, you know, uh, was there at the inception of the VHDP. It's something that we want to put more time into, um, kind of putting feelers out to see who wants to get involved with this. And it's something that we'll continue to work on as time goes on. And then the HDP is also meant as a true portal links to other places. So, you know, we link to the tools that are available. You know, if you you know, if I want to find Chip Fletcher's sea level rise tool or coastal erosion tool, I guess go to HTTP and it's right there for me. Um, other tools and resources as they come online, we'll make them quick. Uh, agencies, things, we can link to them. We give short descriptions. The idea of a true portal, you go in one place and you come out another or you come out with something, right? That's kind of the idea there. Really, everyone has a seat at the table when it comes to, when it comes to this project. 
And then research highlights is something that we're going to try to ramp up in 2024. So also if, uh, elevating other research that's happening around Hawaii. And then my favorite thing is the social media post, uh, which we do every Thursday, where we get information out about you know, new research or different weather phenomenon or different things that make Hawaii's climate unique. We do stuff on cultural resources and we do information on um, the Hawaii mesonet and kind of keep people up to speed on how many stations are involved and things like that. So um, again, Amy, I don't know the password, but Amy is uh, the champion on that for me also. So thanks, Amy. Okay, <clears throat> probably another thing that I'm really excited to tell you about is how we're actually using this data, right? We're at this point now where we have this data, 104 years of rainfall, 34 years of temperature, what are we actually doing with it, right? What, there's, if you don't do something with it, what's the point, right? So <clears throat> there's a few projects that are going on. Um, if you're familiar with the Pacific Drought Knowledge Exchange, you know that our, our kind of our flag, our flagship the deliverable is our, um, is our CCVD, our Climate Change, Climate Variability and Drought Portfolio. It's a 40 page site-specific portfolio of um, site-specific information for a given geography. So for example, we have the Waikiki watershed here in, in Honolulu. And all of this information is specifically related to that watershed. So what we're doing now is we're, we're, we have a grant through NRCS and through uh, the Forest Service, uh, thanks to Christian Giardina, um, allowing us to build the portfolio process into the Hawaii Climate Data Portal so that anybody who wants a portfolio of an area they're interested in, anybody can go and either choose from a pre-selected shape file they can upload their own shape file, or they can just draw an area of interest. I'm told that's easy to do. Again, climate scientists have no idea how you do that, but I'm told it's easy and we're gonna make that available. So um, anybody in this room that wants, that when it's a launch, you go there, you find your site, you download this, you have 40 pages of information about a geography that you're most interested in. It also includes yesterday's data, right? Because it's built into the HTTP, it's not static anymore. Um, prior to this, you'd have to email Derek Ford, who, who, who's there on the bottom of the page there, who makes these portfolios ad hoc when, they, when the requests come in. It's a lot of work on his end. All the data is kind of static on his machine. Now it's available, going to be available to everybody and in near real time. So we're real excited about this project. We just got going on it in this last week here. So we'll launch that in the, uh, in the, in sometime in 2024, hopefully, hopefully in the spring. Another project that we're working on is a fire risk project. This is funded by Hyema. Syed Bettini is, uh, is a leading that, Clay Trowernex involved in that, and a bunch of people that I've, I've shown already. Um, this is where we take all of the products that we have made, all these gridded products, and we use a machine learning algorithm to combine all of these gridded products to produce a gridded fire risk and warning product, right? That's available in near real time. So it's based on yesterday's condition to tell you today's fire risk. Right now it's daily. We might be able to get it to a sub daily at some point here, but really we're at the stages now of just kind of finishing up these gridded products to be able to get. So we're already working on the the fire risk modeling with the machine learning, but um, but but we, we still need to a, a few more things to do. So this will be uh, finished sometime in 2024. Also, um, daily time step. It's well have a historical time series that goes back to about 2002. So if you want to do any historical analysis on fire risk, and then again, it will be updated in near real time. And this is unique because it's um, it'll be like essentially a red flag warning. Now, previously, the red flag warnings for the state of Hawaii come from the Honolulu airport. That's it. You want you get a fire risk thing and you're on the North Shore of Kauai, your information is coming from the Honolulu airport. You're at South Point, a big island, you get a fire alert because the, there's a fire alert at the Honolulu airport, right? So this is going to change the game in terms of making data available because the, all of our maps, all of our gridded products are 250 meters. So if the fire risk is within a 250 meter radius, is, a, is that a red flag, then the warning will be for that. Uh, also, Shereel Hughes in the room here. She's developing her Hawaii Rangeland Information Portal. This is a decision support tool for ranchers to... Um, to uh, uh, estimate their forage production based on El Nino. It's an almanac perspective so that they can help manage their livestock effectively. And this is also being built into the HTTP cyber infrastructure. She's also developed the climate dashboard, a uh, really plain language dashboard that can tell ranchers about how many consecutive dry days they've had, uh, what the current drought conditions are, 
um, how is this differs to like a normal month, a normal uh, January for rainfall and temperature. And a lot of efforts have gone into that to, to establish this product. Uh, we'll be officially launching this in the spring of, of 24. But um, really, um, it's, it's it hats off to Shereel and, and having this um, available and pulling the data from the HEDP. She's kind of one of the first people to build a tool that pulls the data directly from the HEDP. It's probably the first of many. So really, really excited about this also in 24. Um, external product development. Uh, this is key. We have the Hawaii or the risk management agency. It's a federal USDA program that provides an insurance product for ranchers. It's available on the 48 um, Kona states right now, but it's not available in Hawaii because the model they use on the mainland, it does not work for Hawaii rainfall. And they've been struggling with this for years. The ranchers want this product. So I've been in talks with them for the last year or so about how they can utilize HEDP data to deliver this insurance product to ranchers. And their team is working on this now, pulling the data and, um, and doing that. We also have the NOAA State of the Climate Report. If you've ever gone to NOAA State of the Climate, it's a really great report. You can check out the State of the Climate for 48 states but not Hawaii. So uh, now I've been talking with them about using HDP data um, to, to actually produce a monthly state of the climate report for, uh, for the world actually, you know, for Hawaii. So really um, excited about that. And what's most exciting about this is that it's federal uh, agencies depending on HDP data, which could come into play later on when I need money. <laughs> Maybe just delete that part from the end. <laughs> Um, also, I want to mention um, Lucas Fortini and the USGS Pacific Island Ecosystem Research Center. He's one of the first people that have started pulling in that gridded data, utilizing it before it was even available in near real time, developing an avian malaria risk and warning tool. And I think it's, it's been great because he's been able to troubleshoot some of the, the problems for us, or at least let us know there were, there were problems so we could troubleshoot them. So uh, I think that's a really cool thing also, um, a federal agency. Um, yeah, so... <clears throat> Really excited about that, those those products that are being developed. And really everything is pretty much coming out in 2024. So it's going to be a really big year. And it's really great that I can be here today and kind of let you know what, what's ahead. Um, but really, where are we going now? Okay. Well, where are we headed now that we have these products, we have these tools being development? Well, one place we're headed is into the Pacific. So you might have noticed this other uh, Pacific portal button here on the portal, which has been there for quite some time, but it never really officially launched it or told anybody about it other than putting that purple button there because um, I didn't have any funding for this. It's never been in a grant, it's never been anything. It's just been something that I've been doing on the side, kind of building up towards something. I don't know what it is, but it's something that we've been doing. Amy's been, been, been working on this. Um, but you go to the Pacific portal, you can get information on um, these uh, you know, different um, 22 uh, Pacific Island countries and territories. You can um, get links to data, is there, where, where the data is, we link to the data, we link to regional organizations, tools and resources that are available in the Pacific. And then we have a page for country specific information. And right now in that, we have some statistics on the countries and territories. We have <clears throat> some information on NGOs and we have some <clears throat> key national policy documents related to climate change, right? So it's a real easy way to grab this stuff. And I, you know, I've, I use those policy documents and other areas of my work and stuff. So it's useful to me. And I think it would be useful to others as well. But again, this is in its infancy in terms of where we go with this. <clears throat> we also have um, mapping rainfall in US territory. So PyCast has recently awarded a grant to, to the team uh, to improve the data monitoring in American Samoa and Guam. Uh, we are installing some instrumentation to telemeter some of the existing climate stations there. And we are developing a method to uh, map daily rainfall in both of those um, both of those territories. And really, uh, another key part of the grant is to develop the cyber infrastructure in the HDP to do the same thing we're doing with Hawaii maps, visualize, download, create a time series, you know, do an analysis, virtual station, all of those things that we've done now for HDP we can do for Guam and American Samoa once the rainfall maps are made, which you know is, is, is another endeavor, but we feel pretty confident that we can get to that point. Uh, we have a grant from NOAA to operationalize at least the American Samoa um, maps where we can put them in near real time production for flood prediction. Chris Schuler is leading that effort. And then um, <clears throat> I think we'll get some future grants to probably you know do some things like perhaps a, a Guam climate data portal or the GCDP. Been talking with Romina King uh, for about a year about that. 
I think it's very possible to build something like the HTTP for Guam, um, possibly new mesonets. So, you know, building the American Samoa stations into the national mesonet program, you know, technically these territories are part of the national program. Uh, we also have mapping rainfall and RMI, FSM and Palau, nothing I've even thought about yet, but it's kind of on my mind. Once we get through Guam and American Samoa, those would be the likely next candidates and they have a whole different set of data and information. So it'll be a whole different territory at this point. <clears throat> uh, educational opportunities. Um, if you ever heard me give a talk on HTTP, I, I never fail to mention this. Um, Emily Senso has been a champion for me in terms of getting me in touch with teachers and stuff uh, to be able to talk about the HTTP. We had an earth workshop in this room last spring where I was able to demo the HTTP, teach teachers about it and see if they could be interested in developing curriculum around that. Um, <clears throat> We did, uh, Derek made uh, climate portfolios for all of the teachers in the room. We found their elementary schools. We identified what watershed they were in. And then we delivered them a portfolio to show them the school, the watershed, and all the 40 pages of information. And then to see if they were interested in developing curriculum around that as well. Um, <clears throat> so, and then climate mapping. I think that, you know, if my eight-year-old son can make a climate map with in a minute, why shouldn't every kid in Hawaii be making a climate map, right? There could be curriculum developed around that. Go to Hurricane Lane in 2018. How much rainfall fell in your uh, in your area on the Big Island? Oh, there was fires on Maui. Was it wet there? I mean, I have a ton of ideas. The problem is, is that I am in no shape, capacity, or form to develop curriculum. I got ideas, but it's just there's no way I could take that on. It's not in my wheelhouse, but I really think it's important. And I think we're at a stage now where some things can be done to advance that. And then I think connecting with researchers as we build out this uh, these research highlights and things like that, there's a ways to connect students and stuff to people that are doing research, ask questions. And I think it's kind of um, uh, an untapped um, area. So again, I will just kind of plug this now. If folks are interested in getting involved or writing a grant or something to develop education curriculum, I'd be happy to, to work with you and share some ideas. Um, <clears throat> we'll go through this pretty fast, but one thing we're kind of working towards is water balance, daily water balance uh, for Hawaii. Uh, and we have some of the products available for that. So rainfall equals evapotranspiration plus runoff plus change in storage. So we got the rainfall. We're getting close to the ET at this point, a gridded product. Uh, I know the USGS is doing a lot of work in the, in the area of runoff. And then change in storage, the big deal on that is the soil moisture and gridded soil moisture product. And I didn't want to put Yin Fan Tsang's um, picture in here because I want to put the pressure on her, but she's the one closest to closest to doing something like that. And hopefully we can advance that at some point and get a gridded soil moisture product. And then we can get water balance. And that will give you the inflows and outflows of a system. It will help you with crop demands, uh, water availability uh, for, for various uses, managing water and really ecosystem function and health. So that's kind of the pie in the sky, but you know we're working our way towards that ability to do daily water balance. All right, <clears throat> so wrapping up, pretty close to right on time here. Um, it's not the beginning anymore. Every time I've given an HEDP talk, I've always said, oh, I feel like we're at the beginning. I don't feel like that anymore. I feel like we have enough skin in the game to say, okay, we got something. Now we're doing these things, right? So we're not really at the beginning. We have had 40,000 visitors. We've had 100 from 170 different countries, 130 different countries. Big gap there. 30? 30. Okay. It was just 30. 130 different countries. And um, we've had like, you know, millions of files downloaded. So we're getting the solicity. I'm up to 385 followers on my Instagram account, you know? So we're, we're, we're making some serious progress here. Um, the opportunities for decision support, right? So I've mentioned a few that are coming online, but I think others, you know, as, as folks come up with ideas, realize these products are available, they'll be able to do things like, you know, build other tools and resources that can advance, um, you know, our adaptation capabilities. Uh, the Hawaii Mesonet, it's a game changer. Uh, it's unique to the world. I don't think really anybody by the time this is set up is, is going to have the number of stations over the amount of distance that we have the products being produced, I don't think anywhere in the world is gonna have that. Hawaii is gonna be a really a, an example for the world on how to monitor climate and manage climate. So something else I really wanna hold up, I forgot the gold star, but um, imagine a gold star next to that. And then <clears throat> this is really a, a unique time for collaboration. You saw all the pictures, there's people from different departments, institutions, 
you know, the mainland, people are working together really to advance this stuff. You know, I'm constantly trying to unite people around the Hawaii Climate Data Portal because it's not exclusive to any one place or any one person. It's really uh, something for everybody. And I think there's ways for people to get involved and um, uh, to, 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 to build more tools and resources. And um, as well, I mentioned, um, finally, um, the goal of this, right, is not to make gridded products, not to make tools and not to publish papers and give talks. The goal is to actually find ways to improve our ability to adapt to a changing environmental conditions, ultimately protecting or improving livelihoods, right? So we can never literally lose the, the message there. And that's always the way I like to end these talks, right? A lot of fancy stuff, a lot of fancy tools, but if it's not put to use and it's not put in practice and it doesn't actually do something to you know, help somebody make a decision, to help protect the resources, then what good is it? So I think it's always important to kind of hold that message, you know, close to your heart and, you know, go into these things with intention when you're doing things so that, you know, the end product is realized and also, you know, experienced by a, a larger community. So on that, I'm going to say mahalo nui for your attendance. And again, really appreciate everybody being here online and in the room. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So here I'm going to just all the highlight is uh, all the great work you guys have been really, really incredible. Um, we do have time for some questions. Um, I see one online, so let's start there, and we'll come back to the room after that. Um, from uh, Eric Frank Franklin, uh, he asks, uh, says, thanks, Ryan. Um, great talk. Uh, he's wondering if the ACDP will remain his only website or if he plans to uh, uh, develop it into some sort of uh, app in the future. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's, it's, it's possible. I would, I wouldn't move it out. Um, I think, um, you mean like a mobile version of it? Yeah. I mean, we have a mobile version. We got a ways to go on that one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think there are plans and thanks for that because now that I'll put that on the list. Yeah. Um, here in the room, any questions? Maya, go ahead. Great talk. Congratulations on the portal. It's super cool. My question is, um, you talked about these various users, ranchers, farmers, people who are interested in managing fire. Um, how does the HCDP interact with those users to hear their stories about adaptation? Like, do you have a good sense of how people interact with the portal and what they do next? And do you have a vision for how you can collect those stories of adaptation in the future? Yeah. Um, I would say that that all of those things you mentioned are happening right now, right? We have a climate roundtable talk on Thursday. We're bringing together water managers. We're bringing together border water supply. We're bringing together a various range of stakeholders and presenting some of these slides here and talking about the mesonet and trying to get that kind of feedback from them, right? A lot of the times, you know, the, the stuff is just coming available, right? So I don't think we're at that point yet where we can get feedback on how folks are using it. Um, in terms of the ranching tool, like Shereel and I have gone and, and talked to ranchers in the field and showed them the tool. And we're gonna do a soft launch for the ranching community. We're not even gonna invite anybody else. We're not gonna tell anybody. It's gonna be a closed thing where we bring just ranchers to this online environment and show them the tool and get them comfortable with it. So I think we're kind of at that stage now of introducing a lot of these tools and resources. We're kind of past that stage of developing. Well, we'll always be developing, but we're moving into that zone now of getting these products to be used. Yep. So one year from now, I'll answer that question with a little more confidence. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, another question in the room. We'll go back to online after that. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student and uh, interested in uh, using the precipitation data to do some research. Uh, so I'm interested in uh, if there's some ways to do some collaboration or to do further research. Uh, yes, any? Yeah, well, uh, if, if, yeah, if you're interested in precipitation research, you're talking to the right person, uh, that's for sure. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, if you're interested, if you um, have some, some a skill set for coding and stuff, we can get you an API access to the data so you can just pull it onto your machine and you can you know, explore it in certain ways, or we can talk about research questions. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to, to have those conversations with students. So. Yeah, I, I saw uh, uh, information online. It's about the student workshop from uh, January 5th. I remember the date. Uh, I don't know if 
the other I don't know the research point is it uh, the question is the, am I gonna be at the workshop? Uh the question is uh except the workshop uh and uh, maybe if, if there's other uh, opportunities as a graduate students or the researchers can um, I think there's a lot of opportunities. We should probably have a conversation maybe after the talk here and yeah. find out a little more about what you're doing in your department and stuff that you're working with. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. That's your question. Let's go um, to some of the questions online. Um, I, I see Heather Kirkings hand up. I want to, um, I think there's some questions in the chat before that. We'll get to you then, Heather. Um, one from uh, Karen. I hope I got that name uh, Right. Um, great work, Ryan. I'm curious about the fire risk decision support. Uh, do you envision HCDP issuing red flag warnings directly from HCDP or having the tool be used by a National Weather Service to then issue the warnings? Yeah, uh, great question. And I actually meant to mention this in the thing. So the grant, the grant for the Hyema grant, it's, it talks about developing the product, but there's nothing in the grant about what you do once you have the product, right? So I don't know if that's just Hyema's, uh, you know, and it goes into their wheelhouse and then they, I don't know what they'll do with it at this point. But uh, yeah, I've envisioned it um, as being signing up for, you know, uh, a particular mechanism where you get an alert. If in your grid cell, you hit a red flag warning, you're texted that information. And I think that's where, when I talked about where we're going, decision support, that's where it has to go. So once the product gets developed, again, it wasn't in the grant to do any of that. And it's, it, then it's time to talk with the Haima and say, okay, well, what, what are you going to do with this? You know, and we can, you know, it's going to be a public resource. So really anybody could develop something like that. But I think, yeah, for fire, uh, drought, uh, all of these different things that we're going to probably be developing, blood risk, all of these things can be done. In terms of the National Weather Service, that's kind of a tricky thing because the National Weather Service can only use the data that gets into the these these repositories. They can't take our data and make a decision on that because it's locally Hawaii data. If it goes into the National Repository, then they can get it and do it. So we'd have to find a way to either circumvent that or get the data into the you know, or work with the the drought monitor, um, US um, DA, DM um, drought monitor to to you know have them incorporate any drought products or fire products that we have. So I think there's a, there's a few steps that have to be had. It's a great question, and I think that you know we're, we'll probably be addressing it at some point here. But again, we're just working on on the actual model, the fire risk model right now, and getting it operational. Thanks, Ryan. I want to go to Heather Kirkring. Heather, if you uh, have a question or comment, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, appreciate always learning more about what you how this is moving along. Um, I actually was just gonna say something that Mary Vaughn had put in the chat, but I don't think everybody can see it. But we're excited um, to also be uh, to offer uh, Lindsay Ellett, who's recently new with PyCast, to be partnering um, with Ryan and his team to kind of look at what uh, Maya was asking, and in terms of analyzing and evaluating the impact of some of the PDKE portfolio. Or excuse me, some of the well PDKE and the um, portfolios that are being generated. So um, yeah, we're excited for that element too. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Mary Vaughn, for highlighting that and, and Lindsay for your work. Um, let's go back to the room. Any other questions in the room? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So one of the main points you talked about was just having this like database that you have all these I think you said it's like the Mesonet stations. Can you talk a little bit about, I think there's like a picture on your slide, like what is on those stations and the type of data you're collecting, as well as, I think you mentioned there's currently like 40 something stations and you plan to install another 15 or 20 this year. Can you talk about where, like how you decide what those locations are? Like yeah. what goes into that process? Sure, sure. So there's there's, there's 19, for first question, there's like 22 variables. So it's, I mean, it's a whole range of environmental variables that are being measured. Um, and the stations, um, again, there's 42 mesonet stations. There's lots of other stations that exist that measure at least rainfall and temperature. There's some other variables also. Uh, in terms of site selection, though, this is a very complicated thing, right? So you can make, we, initially we made a map that showed where the best places would be to put the stations. 
based on coverage, right? That was the first thing. And then it's like, you look at it and you're like, okay, well, coverage is important, but access is also important, right? Got to be able to get to it. They don't want to pay for a helicopter every time I need to get to the station. And then you need to look at like who owns the land, right? And where is it going to be? And who's going to be able to maintain it? Is it going to be protected? Is it going to be a choice of vandalism? Um, is the permitting going to be complicated to get a permanent station? So there are really, is there going to be a cell phone signal or a satellite signal or something at that location to even telemeter the data? So there's a series of questions that need to be answered, some of them before the next one can be answered. Um, and um, I know that Dylan Giardina, who's on the Big Island right now, is leading a lot of that effort, and Tom Giambaluca. So they would be, if you had really more details than that, they'd be the people to talk to. But I know that it's complicated, and um, it's uh, you know sometimes it takes a way longer uh, than you would think just to figure out where you're going to put a station. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I want to sneak in a couple of concluding marks. We're getting close to the hour. If you wouldn't mind, stick around after that for a couple more questions. Sure. I see a uh -huh. hand up and a couple more online. Um, I just want to uh, invite folks to join us for our next Slice of PyCast um, seminar um, that will be on uh, February 6th at noon. Again, here in HID 210 and online. Look for more information on that. Coming up, um, talk to me with Dr. Becky Ostertag, who will be sharing with us on her research on tropical forest ecology, restoration, and conservation. Um, those of you online, as you uh, as you log off, a, a short survey will come up. Please uh, fill that out if you have some time, give some feedback, and uh, provide any ideas you might have for, for future talks. Um, and then look out for uh, reminders about uh, future upcoming um, PyCast webinars, um, on, including online under our events tab on our website. Um, uh, folks, you've got to run to a meeting, go ahead, but we'll stick around for a few more minutes to answer a few more of these questions. There wasn't, uh, I see a hand up, but I did see um, a question from our friend, uh, Mike DeLue, Alaska Cask, uh, in the chat that I would want to get to. Um, thanks, Ryan. Very cool to see this work. You mentioned both having pre-prepared areas of interest that visitors can summarize over and allowing users to upload shape files. Can you talk about how you selected um, those areas of interest to preload? And if you are learning anything about what areas of interest folks are uploading to summarize over, any trends they're teaching you about your users? Well, um, right, yeah, like I had mentioned, it's a good question. The Initially, we just kind of, it was ad hoc. You wanted a portfolio, you told us where you wanted it. Maybe you had a shape file. Maybe you, you didn't have something, we'd use a tax key ID. We'd find uh, something relevant, a way to, to capture that information. So. When we pre-upload the files, the way we talk about it, we just had our first meeting on this the other day. We'll probably put in all the watersheds. We'll put in all the aupua. We'll probably put in um, all of the, you know, uh, the, the 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 federal lands, the TNC lands, the Kamehameha Schools lands. So there'll be a way to kind of choose between these things that that you know we know exist um, and that 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 could be relevant. And then there. Are, folks that are going to want to have a private property or something, an area or a study area. And those are the shape files that they might have um, that we'll be able to upload. And then, um, you know, if they're willing, if it's a private thing, we'll be, we'll be able to catalog that and leave it there for other folks. And then with the HTTP, what we can do, because we have the cyber infrastructure built around it, we can track all of those things. So we can see how many people are making a portfolio for you know, um, a particular watershed or a particular alpua or something like that. So I think, you know, to answer that question, we kind of first have to get to the point where the automation is in process and folks are, so again, another probably year out before I can answer that one with confidence. But uh, right now, um, you know, things are kind of, you know, like I said, ad hoc when, when somebody needs something or we are engaging with a stakeholder, we create a portfolio for them. It's essentially our calling card. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers uh, the question. Um, maybe we conclude conclude with two related questions here in the chat, and we'll wrap it up. Um, from Eric Franklin and uh, Sharon Ziegler Chan, Chong, um, digital tools funded by extramural grants tend to have a short shelf life. Uh, what is a long term funding plan to continue maintenance and development of HCEP? And, and how, in other words, how can its longevity be ensured? You think? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I'll say this crystal clear: uh, we're meeting with state legislators on next. Um, Tuesday, and we're going to show them excuse me, the Mesonet, and we're going to show them the HTTP. And we are in hopes that we can get some type of dedicated funding from the state 
to support this work. So that's there is no plan right now, um, but we are hoping that we can move in that direction. The Mesonet has a very high operating cost. About half of it is covered when we put our data into the national Mesonet system, but there's a huge shortfall in terms of being able to sustain this. So um, I wouldn't say it's a, hard, a, a, a horse before the cart type of a thing because, uh, or cart before the horse type of a thing, because really we kind of need to build this to show uh, what its value was, right? But now, and now it's gonna be a time. So for the HDP itself, we have uh, funding for another three years for the cyber infrastructure. And um, so we have a little more time, breathing room to kind of figure this out. Every time I write a grant, and I write a lot of grants for the Pacific Job Knowledge Exchange and all these things, I always put in money to support cyber infrastructure and support development like Shereel's tool and things like that. But yeah, it's a good, it's a really good point. There is, it is short term. If, if all the money dried up, you know, unless the University of Hawaii decided from the goodness of their heart that they were going to dedicate resources to keeping the HTTP going, it would be really hard um, to, to, to keep it going. So um, great question. And I, you know, hope again to have a, an answer for you in a year. Right. I think we'll be back next year. I got a lot of questions to answer. We would love to have you back. <laughs> yeah. We could spend a whole day with yeah. the whole team here, potentially. There's yeah. so much great work going yeah. on. So another big round of applause for Ryan and the whole team.